Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamps, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Cosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 371 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how are you doing this week on this Thursday On this Thursday morning for you? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing good, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. Always good when speaking with you. Uh, the show is being recorded on the Thursday, so it'll be going out in a few hours. Uh, we're going to start here with the review part of the show. It's gonna, it's gonna be this one. We're gonna start with. Um, it was, it was last Friday, um, Friday, November eighteenth, at the Tech Point Arena, a uh, Tech Port Arena, I should say, in San Antonio, Texas. Over here, friend of the show, Hector Tanahara, with a win. That's his twentieth win now, twenty and one with a draw. Um, his opponent, Antonio Meggia, now 10 and 5, retired on his store after five rounds. Didn't want to come out for the sixth and final round. Moving out now to the La Pelastre in La Conner in France. Over here, it was on Canal Plus. Um, three fights to mention. Milan Pratt, now 18 and 0, a knockout in round two against Stephen Dangyo, who's now 20 and 6 with three draws. That one was for the vacant EBU European Super Welterweight title. Milan Pratt, um, yeah, I mean, I can see him in a big fight soon, I think. Uh, we've also got Kevin Sadjo, who's now 19-0. and He defended his European super middleweight title, the EBU title, against Emre Kukur, who's now 19-2 and with a draw. Kukur got TKO'd in round seven, so a good win there for Kevin Sadjo. But the main event, Arsene Gulamirian, now 27-0. and He successfully defended his WBA super world cruiserweight title against the undefeated Alexei Egorov who's now 11 and 1. I think both men were coming off um quite long layoffs if I'm not mistaken, especially Gulamirian if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um yeah, weighed in at 195 and a half pounds for that cruiserweight contest there. A good win there in the end, a unanimous decision over 12 rounds. Moving out now to Mexico City. This one we have to mention, of course. Um, friend of the show, former IBF world champion Carlos Molina. He put on his own event and he boxed on the card as well. Um, he got in with a guy called Oziel Son... Uh, Oziel Santoyo. It was a 10 round contest. Santoyo 13 and 2 with a draw. Carlos Molina um, going in 38 and 12 with two draws. Now 38 and 13 with two draws. Carlos Molina upset over the distance. I think it was a split decision or a majority decision um, to Oziel Santoyo, which is a massive upset, obviously. Um, amazing for Santoyo to get. A scalp like that on his record, you know, he didn't have a pretty one, but he's now got a former world champion on there. Carlos Molina felt he won the fight, um, but yeah, it was uh, it was on national TV in Mexico. A lot of people saw it. Um, not a good look, obviously, for Carlos to lose to a guy like that, especially on his own show. Um, but yeah, obviously, he felt like he won the fight. I didn't see it. Um, I will take a look, but um, yeah, guided really for Carlos Molina, man. He's been building such a positive thing of his own in Mexico, and for this to happen, um, it's it's a setback, you know. It's a, it's a big, big setback, especially if you know he wanted a big fight um, anytime soon. I guess you know in a different place. Um, moving out now to another part of Mexico at the Arena Astros in Guadalajara. Over here we had. Just going to mention the main event, Jaime Munguia, with an easy win, a third round KO. He's now 41 and 0, a KO against Gonzalo Correa, who's now 21 and 6. Um, Correa was down in round two and then in round three. Just a mismatch. We talked about it really last time out. Um, we, we spoke about, obviously, the fact that Munguia really just. Um, 
likes to fight low-level guys, and I don't understand why, and I don't know if he's going for that Mayweather record. It seems like maybe he is, but there's no real reason. I know he's still young, so he probably can smash that Mayweather record, actually, but there's no real reason why he doesn't go for a bigger fight, you know, I think he could easily get a title shot, you know, obviously he's got pretty much, um, you know, a, a powerful stable behind him, obviously with Golden Boy, he's one of their, their star men, really, if you, if you think about it, Golden Boy is a lot thinner than it used to be, and, you know, he's headlining shows, you know, on his own in Mexico, the main attraction, so obviously there's a lot of power behind him, but for whatever reason, um, He's, he's opting to take these these easier fights, and I, I don't quite get it. I do not understand the plan with him. I'd love to ask him that question. What is the plan, my man? But I don't know. Uh, moving out now to the Telford International Centre in Telford, Shropshire, United Kingdom. This one was on BT Sport. Um, let's start with the undercard. Anthony Yard now 23-2, and a knockout for him in round three against Stefani Kuykov, who's now... 14 and 2. The good thing about Koykov is he could he could apparently punch. He did give it a go, to be honest. He was a bit brave, you know. He, he, he tried to land some big punches on Yard. Um, obviously, Yard was way too good for him. You know, Yard has, has pretty much got every punch in the book. Um, he put the pressure on, obviously, and, and forced a stoppage. Um, good to see Yard back out as well, because he has had, obviously, a bit of a frustrating time recently. Um, in and out of the ring, actually, but he's he's you know he's he's back back looking good again. And I know that we can't get carried away with this win because it wasn't a guy that was supposed to cause him any problems at all. And he came for it as expected. I expected an early knockout within the first four rounds or whatever, and he got that. Um, obviously, straight after the fight, they've announced that Baturbiev will be coming to London next year to face Anthony Yard. It's going to be massive, that fight there. And do not blink, because both men can bang. Um, it's, it's a fantastic fight. Um, elsewhere on the card, Ethan James with a win now, 10-0. and A points win there over 10 rounds against Keenan Wainwright, who's now 8-2. and um, Ethan James was actually down in the first round himself, but he obviously got back up and won on points. And the main event... Liam Davies now 13 and oh it was a um a unanimous decision over 12 rounds against Iron Up Baluta who's now 15 and 4 it was for the vacant EBU European Super Bantamweight title and the WBC International Super Bantamweight title um Liam Davies boxed really well to be totally honest when he used his jab um Baluta couldn't really get past it we know what Baluta is he comes to have a fight he comes to put the pressure on um he doesn't always, I think, uh, you know, think before he does things. And when he's in that ring, all he wants to do is put the pressure on you, make it rough, and um, hopefully draw you into his fight. Because he's got a good engine. He will keep coming and coming and coming and coming. And he's had a lot of close fights. He's upset, you know, upset the apple, the apple cart sometimes if you don't have a good engine. And it was a test for Liam Davies. You know, I thought that Baluta stood a good chance. But to be honest with you... Um, Davies bossed the fight pretty much from start to finish. Uh, Baluta at times would start his attacks from too far out. He'd fall short, you know. He'd he'd um, he'd he'd get when he did get close. Sometimes um, Davies would would you know grab hold of him. But no, Davies boxed really well, landed some fantastic uppercuts as well at times. So brilliant, brilliant fight for him. A great learning fight, and um, that's all it was. It was just a learning fight. I feel like that's you know that's going to make him a much better fighter beating someone like Baluta, who's got some good scalps on the record. You know, had a close fight with Michael Conlon for God's sake. Liam Davies, it was not a close fight. He won very handily, very impressive, very very good. Um, moving out now to the final card of the review part. It took place at the. Moon Moody Theatre in Austin, Texas, USA. It was live on, um, I think it might have been the Zone pay-per-view. I've got no idea. I didn't watch it. But the main event, Greg Hardy, now 2-0 and as a pro. A unanimous decision over four rounds against Hassim Rackman Jr., friend of the show, former co-host, now 12-2. and Rackman down in round two. Um, I mean, let, let's talk about it briefly, Eddie. I know that you saw, I think, a few bits of it. I've only pretty much seen um, about a 40 second video. I don't know. You've probably seen more than me, but devastating for Rackman. Obviously, friend of mine, friend of yours. You've known him a long, long time. Um, but, you know, this was a guy that obviously had the opportunity to box Jake Paul. There was 
you know, a disagreement on the weight. He felt he was still going to make the weight. I think he still did in the end. I think he still made the weight, even though the fight was off. Um, or he might have missed it by about a pound, which would have been some kind of um, penalty of a bit of a percentage of his purse, which he was fine with doing. And, you know, for whatever reason, he didn't he didn't make the check weight, which he didn't, um, he didn't understand was contracted. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, whatever. It was just a real mess, and he missed out on a massive payday. It would have been life-changing. He was coming off a knockout loss to Kenzie Morrison at the time. And... Um, you know, the fight didn't happen. Obviously, he, he clings on to this YouTube boxing thing because he knows it's massive. His followers on Instagram went from about 5,000 to about 260,000. Everything was fantastic. His profile shot up just from being associated and linked with Jake Paul. He was going to get the Vita Belfort fight. We wanted him to beat Vita Belfort to avenge the loss, to, uh, the, the win, um, or the loss that Holyfield suffered against him. Um, obviously, Belfort... Uh, pulled out the fight with COVID, in steps this guy, Greg Hardy, I didn't know who the hell he was, he was one and I was a pro, he's dropped Rackman there, um, obviously Rackman down in the second round, once you're dropped in a in a four round fight, it's extremely hard, but I don't know how he looked for the rest of those rounds, I don't know if you can share any insight, and we should also mention that um, Greg Hardy did weigh 94 pounds more than Hassan Rackman Jr. Jesus. Wow, I didn't realize that. Hassan I mean, Rackman did... weighed in at 226. Greg Hardy was 320. Jeez, I did not know he weighed that much. And I, he's a, he was formerly in um, in the MMA. He was he was doing MMA, but they had a 265 pound weight limit, so it was. It, <laughs> I guess that was kind of limiting his his ability to do certain things. I guess. Uh, but in boxing, obviously, there's no weight limit, so you can weigh whatever the hell you want to weigh. And you could clearly see in the fight that Hardy was, you know, a great deal bigger. But um, and he, from what I understand, I mean, I've seen certain parts. He didn't look bad. Even, one, even the shot he caught uh, Rockwood was a, was like a counter uh, counter right or I can't remember. I think it was a counter right. Yeah, it was a counter right hand which was like kind of a little bit of a surprise to me. I didn't know how skilled he would be, but early in the fight, like if you look at the first few minutes and I didn't see it, my, the clip I seen was about the same clip you've seen, I think probably. And because I tried to see more and for whatever reason, I wasn't able to watch the whole thing, but um, he was getting caught early. It looked like it was going to go the way it was supposed to go, where he was going to outpoint the guy, at least, you know, possibly get a, a lead stoppage. But for whatever reason, I guess the pressure got to him. The size probably took hold a little bit more than we would have expected it. I mean, look, Rock is a, his, you know, he's a, he should be a skilled, but he is a skilled fighter. Like he knows how to box. He's been doing it for a very, very long time. You would think that he would be able to figure it out with these guys, even though there's a, there's a size discrepancy, you know what I mean? It, it, it may be a strength discrepancy, but there's there's some there's something called skill and IQ and know-how in general that should win the day for you in a situation like that. But for some reason, even like you seen with the, with Kenzie Morrison, you know, he got hit, he felt it, and reacted to it, and wasn't able to recover. You know what I mean? And it, it just and and in this fight, he was able to get to the end. But he loses a decision to a guy that he should easily outpoint, in my opinion. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I didn't. I didn't see enough of it to dis, to to kind of decipher how good uh, Greg Hardy was skill wise. I know. I think he had Shannon in his corner, Shannon Briggs. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know how much that helped his skill level, but you know, maybe it did add something to him. But um, I just don't. I just. I just. I just look at. I look at. I look at uh, Rock Jr. and I just, I just wonder, man, what's going on, and 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 has he missed the boat, especially now losing to a guy like this who's only want to know, and and your aspirations to be a world champion is, it's looking a little dark right now. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't count anyone out, but it's it's, it's looking like it's going to be a little rough to get to where he wants to go, um, considering you know, the losses he's had recently. Yeah, no, I agree, a hundred percent, Eddie. And like I say, that wraps up the review part of the show. The final thing for me to do in this part is to welcome this week's special guest. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated super featherweight contender, ranked number one in the world with a WBO. It is, of course, Mr. Archie Sharp. Archie, welcome back on the show, my man. Thanks for having me on. About time, about time. It's got about me, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, Arch, we last spoke back in November um, of last year. Like we say, it's been, it's been a whole year. It was just after your win against Alexis Cabor at York Hall. Obviously, I was there for that one. Um, you've had just the one fight since then, a bit of a tick over. You beat Alex Rat back in June in Leeds. Um, a lot of people didn't get to see the fight, but just tell us, for those that didn't get to see it, how did you rate your performance and, you know, what happened in the fight for those that didn't see it, Arch? Yeah, it was an all-right performance, mate. Just getting back out, you know, just, well, trying to keep active as possible. That come up, not last minute, but I probably had about three, four weeks' notice. So I quickly um, jumped back in the ring, had 10 rounds, one all 10 rounds, really. So, uh, so, yeah, it was nice just to shake off a few cobwebs, mate, and um, crack on. I was hoping to be back out before Christmas. Um, that was the plan, but we shall see. Yeah, you've obviously had a lot of, um, you know, fights fall through and stuff. Nothing concrete as such, but um, yeah, a lot has a lot has um, happened in terms of things falling through for you since that fight against Rat Archie. Um, obviously, not much has happened in terms of progression in terms of your career but obviously things have happened at super featherweight um, particularly Shakur Stevenson a man that you had your sights set on for a long time he lost his title on the scales he moved up in weight um, I know it's been a while since that event happened now but just tell me what your reaction was to that obviously we know he always looked quite big for super feather yeah um, do you know what I was surprised he lost it on the scales to be fair um I know he was getting, he was, he's been getting bigger and and he's growing through the weights. But I was very shocked to see that he, uh, like to say, to lose it on the scales. But obviously, as you know, I jumped straight on it, straight on the old Twitter, and made a big point that I want to be fighting for the vacant WBO. So I jumped on that opportunity as soon as I could. Um, but yeah, so now he's gone to lightweight. So I'm sure me and Shakur will bump into each other very, very soon when I moved to 135, um, so it's not out the window, that fight, but for the minute, it's a fight that I've had to put on the back burner. Yeah, um, he didn't spend too long at 130, which is kind of crazy, really. Hopefully, he stays at 126, 130, then 135 in the space of what months are we? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Hopefully, he's not going to be up at welterweight by the time you move to lightweight. Um, <laughs> the belt obviously became vacant. Normally, we would see the number one ranked guy and the number two ranked guy fight for the vacant belt, but somehow... You were you were skipped over. You were frozen out. We're now going to see the vacant title uh, put on the line for Emmanuel Navarrete and Oscar Valdez. Valdez as well, a man who already got his shot at this exact title back in April. Obviously lost handily to Shakur Stevenson. How did top rank pull that off, Archie? Because I don't know. You're right, mate. I should be should be there stepping in to fight number two. One and two should fight, or at least like Navarrete is coming up. So. Obviously, it'd be mandatory. Um, so it should be number one, and num and and obviously Navarrete coming up from um, from featherweight. But to be honest with you, as a fan, it's a good fight. Navarrete and Valdez is a great fight to watch. Um, but unfortunately, for where I am in my position, it's just for a bit frustrating being at number one now for probably what a year, just under a year. I've been sitting at number one, and then flat to happen. It is definitely a uh, kick in the teeth. Yeah, and just briefly on that fight, I, I want to ask how you think it's going to go. Obviously, it's an all-Mexican affair. It's, it's set to happen early 2023. Um, you know, politics aside, frustration aside is probably a better word. It's a good fight. Yeah. I think it's going to be a good fight, Arch. Do you? Yeah, I think it's going to be a great fight. And, uh, and um, do you know what? I'm excited to have the winner of it, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's going to be a great fight. be interesting to see how Navarrete comes up to super featherweight. Obviously, he's been getting big. Um, through the weights and like you say Mexican, Mexican style fight I believe they're both going to meet in the middle um, and I don't believe Valdez is a massive super featherweight either so it'd be interesting I think it's a great fight and uh, I don't think it'll go, I don't think it will um, go the distance I'd be very surprised if it does and you do hopefully have some good news on the horizon finally. It's been reported that you'll be boxing in a final eliminator on the Charlo um, on the Charlo Sioux undercard in the US. It's said that you'll be boxing Liam Wilson of Australia. What can you tell us about that one, Arch? Yes, yeah, so it's not all doom and gloom. Um, 
things are happening and it's, like, it's just been a bit of a slow couple of years for myself but it's all in good time and trusting the process and it's all working out very very well I'll be coming over to the States to fight Liam Wilson on the Charlo undercard against um, against the zoo. So, and then I'll be fighting Liam Wilson, who's ranked, who is a number three in the BO. And um, and then, yeah, for a final eliminator. So once I beat Liam Wilson, I'll be then going to fight the winner of Navarrete and Valdez. That is the plan. I'm just waiting on, um, just waiting on the teams now to negotiate. You know, just to get the politics out of the way. Um, and, yeah, mate, I'll be getting on the plane straight to Vegas and uh, winning my Eliminator in January. And that's Jan 28th. Am I right in saying that? That's what I've been told. Um, that's what the news circling is. I believe he's, he's released a few statements as well, saying it's the 28th. So we're just waiting on um, teams to confirm, but that's what it's looking like, mate, very much so. Okay, and obviously, if it is to to be Liam Wilson, if it does go ahead like we like we think it will, um, what do you know about him, Arch? Obviously, I only know a tiny bit. He's slightly taller than you, which I don't really say too much for a guy at super feather. No. Um, and he's got that that sole defeat. He was stopped, but he did come back and then stop Joe Noyne in the rematch. Yeah, so um, no, he's a good kid. He's number three in the, in the WBO. You know what I mean? He's obviously done his. He's done his work to get to where he's at. I do know that he's been around the amateur circuit, Commonwealths, and um, and some big competitions in the amateur game. So he's going to be very, very well scored, as we know. Um, he's got a few stoppages out of most, well, most of them are stoppages out of the wins that he's had. Um, and like you say, he's only been defeated once, and then he returned that and got a win. So look, we're expecting a tough fight. It's definitely probably going to be, well, you'd say on paper, could potentially be one of the toughest fights so far in my career. Um, but yeah, very well school kid, and this is what we want. Do you know what I mean? These are the big fights and the hard fights that we've been that we've been shouting for. These are the fights that we've wanted for a long time, and um, and yeah, I think this is a great fight that where Archie Sharp will come in on, on full game, and everyone will see what I'm, what I can do. And it's a brilliant opportunity as well, like a huge card for you to be on to go out there in the states and box on an undercard like this for the first time in a big in a big city as well. It's it's massive for you. Um, I just want to touch on obviously that Navarrete Valdez fight. We both said it'd be a good fight, and I know that in your eyes, you you obviously have envisioned beating Liam Wilson and then getting in there with the winner of Valdez Navarrete. I'm sure that you believe you'd beat both of them, but is there one that you'd rather? face or, or or not so much do you know what it's not even about um I'd rather face it's uh, that styles make fights and to be honest with you um that never in everybody knows i won't have to go looking for him do you know what i mean he'd just be there um and that's of course shown the blueprint on uh oscar valdez so uh i'm to be fair mate i'm ready for either or the main thing is obviously being wilson in january and then the winner of them two uh, will be will be great, mate. That's what we're looking at. So yeah, either, either or, to be honest with you, mate, either one of them. And I'm talking to you now. Uh, this week is a, a huge week for your gym. Obviously, you've got a lot of your gym mates in action this weekend at the O2. You've got Dennis McCann getting in with the experienced Joe Ham. You've got Sam Noakes getting in with the undefeated 12 and 0 Calvin McCord. And then, of course, Pierce O'Leary gets in with a Namibian fighter who's never been stopped. How do you think they'll all get on, Arch? Yeah, do you know what? We are um, we're definitely blessed with the gym that we've got. It's all great talent down there. The boys are in unbelievable shape. Um, they're just doing hey, a hey, bit I'm going to pause the you there and say the girls as well. Can't forget Sky. Oh, yeah, of course, of course, of course. We've got Sky. She's just flying. She's in her own lane, mate. She's flying. She's just flying every every other week, I think. And she's, um, but she'll country. be out soon. She's, yeah, she's out again, I believe, in, um, in, in, in the new year. So, yeah, no, of course, we can't forget about Sky. But, no, everyone's flying down there. Um, and the boys are in great shape, so they'll be just doing their last little last little bits for the weight, and then uh, and then yeah, they're ready to rock and roll for the weekend. So they're all going to be in very good shape. Looking forward to um, great performances from all three of them. And obviously, you want them all to win, but I've got a feeling that secretly deep down, you don't want Sam Noakes to get a knockout and overtake you with ten KOs. Am I right? <laughs> no, do you know. No, do you know what? You see with me, mate, it's all love. It's all good. It's, it's good to see. And I've, and I've generally said that um, it's, it's just going to be interesting to see what sort of level it takes for Sam not to get a stoppage. Because I just think at the minute he's just blowing everyone out, whether it's uh, southern area level, European level, 
uh, British level. Do you know what I mean? All he's, 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 he's flying, mate. And I generally believe I'll be very, very surprised if it goes a distance. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm rooting for him to get another stoppage. And uh, it's good. It's good to see him. That's say Pierce <clears throat> come off a great stoppage last fight. Dennis has got a nice little step up here with um with Joe Am who's been a who's been about been around the amateur scene. So um this probably bring the breast out of Dennis. So yeah, it'd be, it'd be great, mate. It'd be a good uh, good night of boxing, I'm looking forward to it. Good night of boxing, good undercard with your gym mates and the main events are cracker as well. We're gonna see obviously Zach Parker against John Ryder. Um what's your take on that one as well, Archie? It's a great, great fight, good clash of styles, good good um what's the word? Um um, crossroads kind of fight, I guess. Yeah, it's a great fight. That Parker's a big old boy for the weight. Um, yeah, do you know what? I'm actually very interested to see the fight how it plans up because you see Ryder, you can never write Ryder off. Um, he's a great, very well experienced at that level. Um, so no, I think it's a great 50 50 fight. Uh, do you know what? To be honest with you, I haven't actually got a winner on this. Um, I'm just going to sit back as a fan and just enjoy the boxing and, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Either way, it would uh, please all the fans, um, no matter what. Yeah, for sure. And just finally, Arch, before we let you go, if you've got any closing words to the listeners, um, obviously you haven't been on for a year. That's uh, that's my fault. Apologies. But what's your message? The <laughs> listeners love. <laughs> no, just the all. You on. Just loving all the support. Um, and look, looking forward to 2023. It has been a slow couple of years, but the fights are now where we want what we want. A final eliminators, world titles, and uh, yeah, three big fights coming in 2023, and then moving to one, one three five to uh, chase them big fights there as well. Hey, it would be brilliant if it all comes through for you. I'd love to see it. First stop, of course, <laughs> January 28th. Listen, Archie, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, my man. You know this. Best of luck when you invade the US early next year, and we'll speak sometime afterwards. Oh, God bless, my man. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with this one. I mentioned it briefly in the review part, but we're going to see it. Um, It's it's obviously um, Arta Baturbiev coming to the UK. Oh my goodness, it's going to be a massive fight, isn't it? It's going to be happening at the the OVO Arena, or the OVO Arena, which is pretty much... um, the Wembley Arena, by the way, it's been renamed, whatever, it's going to be going down, like I say, the 28th of January um, next year, um, huge, huge fight, obviously, Baturbiev coming to defend his unified light heavyweight titles against Anthony Yard, um, it's, it's just going to be a monster, monster fight, it's going to be one of those fights where you just can't blink, obviously, not many people giving Anthony Yard a chance, that's absolutely fine, um, but, you know, there's no one who can say the guy can't punch, and I think he's proven that his power's real, obviously, lost to, um, to, to Sergei Kovalev, had Kovalev absolutely going at one point, and blew his load, basically, and, um, you know, ended up getting stopped off a jab, but really, it was pure exhaustion, he was down on the floor, and, you know, he he couldn't get up. He was pinned to the bloody floor at the end. Um, yeah, since then, obviously lost to um, to Lyndon Arthur, then come back and annihilated Lyndon Arthur. And that's, that's me being polite. I, I do like Lyndon Arthur. But, yeah, he's back and he's looking good again. Artur Baturbiev now 38 years of age. Um, I think maybe coming off an injury as well, if I'm not mistaken. So the timing's right. They've got home advantage. He's coming to the UK. I think Frank Warren's got a lot of confidence in Anthony Yard, and I would absolutely love to see him do it. Oh, my goodness. I hope to be there. It's going to be mega. Friend of the show, Anthony Yard. Um, what else do we have? Um, December the 10th, Tiafimo Lopez will now be fighting Sandor Martin, who, of course, sprung to, I guess, the top of boxing fans' minds when he upset the apple cart by beating Mikey Garcia. Um, so that's going to be a good fight there. Obviously, Sandor Martin's a proper 140 fighter, and um, Tiafimo Lopez gets in with him. Obviously, Martin's a really good mover and stuff. I think that's a great fight, Tiafimo Lopez, Sandor Martin, December the 10th. Um, it was supposed to obviously be Tiafimo and Jose Pedraza, but Pedraza has contracted what they're saying is a non-COVID related illness. So I'm not sure what's gone on with him, with him, but um, some people actually think this is a tougher fight there for, um, for Teofimo Lopez. We'll have to wait and see. Um, what else do we have? What else do we have? Um, 
Javante Davis will be taking on Garcia. It's not Ryan Garcia. No, no, no. It's Hector Luis Garcia. I'm going to be totally honest. I don't know who the guy is. <laughs> I think I probably made everyone a bit worried there for a second. <laughs> what was you going to say, Eddie? <laughs> I think it's the one that beat... I mean... Oh, man. I can't remember exactly now who he's fought. But he beat somebody. He's 16-0. and 0. Um, He beat Chris Colbert. There we go. That's it. He just over. And that's where he got, you know, he got his uh, his credibility based off of that that win. So that's why he's now in this position. It's an interesting interesting fight on paper, you know, him beating a good guy, like a prospect like Chris Colbert, where most people think, you know, Chris Colbert was a surefire world champion soon. And him and he ended up upsetting that situation. So now they're looking at, you know, maybe it might be something that we'll see with uh, uh, you know, with Tank, but I just don't see it happening with Tank. I really don't. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, um, Hector Luis Garcia, like I say, 16-0, and beat Chris Colbert, um, then boxed for the WBA World Super Featherweight title against Roger Gutierrez, beat Gutierrez. That was last time out back in August. And... Um, yeah, so if I'm not mistaken, he's the reigning WBA World Super Featherweight World Champion, but this fight's going on at lightweight, so he'd be moving up, and I don't think he'd, um, well, he's not defending his belt, so I'm guessing he's going to hold on to that for the meantime, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, it's a better fight maybe than I thought it was. Fair play yeah, to him. It's 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 going to be interesting at, at the least. I just, I just really, from watching him fight before, he's good, he got some good skills, and obviously good IQ. You know, he knows, obviously knows what to do. He knows his way around the ring. It's just, Tank is so explosive, man. It's just like, it's hard to see, you know, like I'm, I'm not expecting, oh, he's going to walk in there and just knock the guy out because the key, the key, like I said, he has a good IQ and he's a good uh, a good fighter. But it's just, once you get to this level, there's there's small things that separate. But when you have the, the eraser that Tank has, and the ability to land the shot, it makes it really difficult to see. It's like even with really, really skilled and talented fighters uh, against Tank, it just it's because it, he's skilled too. You know, he's not. He, it's not that he's not a he, he can box. He can box just as well as most. So even with guys that are that are that are top notch, it just got to be extremely careful. You got to walk that fine line, otherwise. You get caught with something that could just be, you just could mark the beginning of the end or the end. So it's just a tough situation with, with, with anybody that really has to face the kid. And that concludes the news part of the show. Uh, moving on now to the preview part. We're going to mention this one here. It takes place tomorrow at the Zenith Metropole in Nantes. Um, in, in France over here the main event for the IBA World Super Worldweight title David Popot um, who is 26-0 and with a draw I'm sure I'm pronouncing that surname wrong it's probably Papa or something like that <laughs> he gets in with Bilal Jikitu who's 15-1 and one. that one loss came to Sam Eggington if people remember um, it was at the back end of 2021 when him and Sam Eggington boxed in Coventry and it was like fight of the year it was a brilliant fight Eggington ended up winning a split decision so so um Jikutu's quite a good fighter there but I think he's quite a big underdog here against David Papa um <laughs> moving on now to this one it also takes place tomorrow Friday at the York Hall Bethnal Green it's going to be on channel five I didn't know that I'm going to set that one up to record if I'm not going to be watching it because uh, I think it's probably going to clash with the England game man playing USA Eddie hey hey there's a bit of rivalry there hope we smash you guys out the park <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, on this card, two friends of the show getting on it. Uh, we're going to see Harlem Eubank, fifteen and zero, getting in with Tom Farrell of Liverpool. Um, I think he's from Liverpool. Twenty-one and five. Remember him getting stopped years ago by O'Hara Davies. That's over ten rounds there at super lightweight. All the best to Harlem. Also, we have Liam Williams, twenty-three and four with a draw. I think he's back now with Gary Lockett in Wales, and I think this is his comeback fight after getting um, beaten up really by Chris Eubank Jr. Um, he gets in with Nizar Trimetch, who's nine and three with two draws over ten rounds there at middleweight. Moving out now to this one it goes down at the o2 arena in greenwich london united kingdom it's going to be live on bt sport we have pierce o'leary 10 and 0 getting in with emmanuel mungand 
Mungandeja. Or Mung, I don't know. Anyway, he's a guy from Namibia, 16 and three with a draw. Um, never been stopped. It's for the it's for the vacant WBC international super lightweight title. All the best there to Pierce O'Leary, who I'm hearing amazing things about. We've also got Sam Noakes, nine and zero, getting in with um, Calvin McCord, who's twelve and zero. That one's for the vacant Commonwealth and the WBC international silver lightweight title. Sam Noakes, friend of the show. All the best to him, nine and zero with nine KOs. He's been dying to get to ten and zero with ten KOs. He's been talking about it every single fight. He wants to get to ten and zero with ten. KOs. He's been, um, you know, talking about it since he was about four and zero. And if, of course, he becomes uh, he becomes victorious by knockout on Saturday, then he overtakes Archie Sharp. So he'd have the most knockouts in the gym. We just spoke to Archie a minute ago. There, that's what the joke was about. Um, Noakes wants to overtake him, I think, and um, I, I would say he probably will. He's going to be desperate for the KO. Um, Dennis McCann as well on the card, thirteen and zero. It's for the vacant Commonwealth title against Joe Ham, who's seventeen and three. Been around the block, Joe Ham. 12 rounder um I expect McCann probably to win on points, but it could be an interesting fight there. McCann, I think, is improving, though, all the time. Uh, we also have a great fight between Hamza Shiraz, 16-0, and River Wilson Bent, 13-1-1. The one loss came to Tyler Denny. We were reminded, um, I think it was l not last weekend, the weekend before, how good Tyler Denny can be. So losing to him is no real shame. I think it was a close fight as well there. So Hamza Shiraz, once again, in another kind of test and they're building him correctly I think steadily but carefully um, it's for the vacant Commonwealth and WBC silver middleweight title um, the main event though oh my goodness what a fantastic fight Zach Parker 22-0 tried to get the fight with Demetrius Andrade it just didn't happen but he fights here for the vacant WBO interim world super middleweight title against John Ryder 31-5 and I've always had a soft spot for John Ryder like Honestly, John Ryder is one of my favourite fighters in the UK. I love John Ryder. I get on with him like a house on fire. Zach Parker, though, um, I've I've got a bit closer to over the years. I'm very close with his manager, Neil Marsh. So it's it's such a tough position for me to be in. I hate when two guys I really like are fighting each other because I kind of don't want anyone to lose. But um, I'm hoping for a draw. Um, <laughs> but no, honestly, um, it's a fantastic, fantastic fight. Um, Zach Parker has just been, you know, ticking all the boxes, stopping people that's never been stopped before. He's been number one to Canelo for about two years. You know what I'm saying? The guy is seriously, seriously underrated. His profile's not where it should be. But this guy is a huge problem. Huge problem. Become the first man to stop Vaughn Alexander, the brother of Devon Alexander. And we know that he's a tough guy. Um, you know, he's he's a real, real, real talent, Zach Parker. But if I'm not mistaken, he's never boxed a Southpaw before, and John Ryder is in the form of his life. Last time out, he beat Danny Jacobs. You know, he is a very good fighter who seems to be at the top of his game. Obviously, a Southpaw, um, and he's a, he's like a battering ram. They throw him in with fighters that he shouldn't beat, and he seems to keep coming up with the results. So, it's it's a tough one, man. Zach Parker's on the up. John Ryder deserves a world title shot. The winner obviously becomes the interim champion and you'd have thought that they would get the crack at Canelo or maybe if Canelo was to vacate, they'd get elevated. So I just want both guys to win. It's so hard. It's so hard. Um, I I'm not going to pick a winner. I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to sit on the fence and, uh, and, and just say, I really like both guys. And I think it's going to be a great fight. If Zach Parker can go in there and knock out John Ryder, I'll be speechless. I, I wouldn't be shocked, but I'd be speechless because that would be so impressive. But at the same time, John Ryder's got so much experience. I mean, God, God, God. It's going to be a great fight. Cannot wait to see it. Uh, moving out now to the Wembley Arena, which um, is sad to see two cards, both in the UK, both clashing, both happening in London. You know, just a few miles away from each other. But this one's an Eddie Hearn show, going to be live on DAZN. Um, over here, we're going to see on the undercard... Pat McCormack, 2-0, getting in with Christian Andino, who's 16-5 and with two draws. Uh, that's over six rounds there. We're going to see Chevon Clark as well, 3-0 with three KOs, getting in with Jose Ulrich, who's 17-5. and 
Um, that's over eight rounds there at Cruiserweight. We've got Sandy Ryan, four and one, defending her WBC International Super Lightweight title over two, over ten two-minute rounds against Anihi, um, Anihi Sanchez, who's 21 and five. I think she's a former world champion. Generally quite durable. I'd say this one will probably go the distance. Sandy Ryan could win on points, but we did see her eked out over the distance, didn't we, earlier on against... Um, the other lady from, from South America. I forgot her name right now. But, you know, she lost that one. Come back and avenged it. Boxed really well in that second fight. But I think Anihi Sanchez is another one like that. Another one where she could spring an upset, possibly. You know, she's very experienced. Done the distance loads of times. Um... You know, very experienced. It's, it's a tough fight. They're really rushing Sandy Ryan. And obviously, she's got the talent, you know, for to, to, to warrant that. But it's a tough one. Sanchez is a 5-1 to one underdog, by the way. So, if anyone fancies that, that's a good price. Um, elsewhere on the card, friend of the show, Craig Richards, 17-3 and three with a draw. Um, he fights here for the WBA International Light Heavyweight title in a comeback fight after losing to Josh Boatze. He gets in with Ricard Bolotniks, another guy that lost to Boatze. Um, he's 19-6 and six with a draw. Bolotniks obviously took Boatze into the 11th round, I think it was. He took him the furthest before uh, Craig Richards took him into the 12th round and obviously went the distance with him um yeah um good fight good fight I think Craig Richards should win this one um it's going to be interesting to see how he looks after the loss but having said that it's not obviously the first loss of his career every every time he seems to lose he comes back stronger we saw that against Bivol we saw that against um against Frank Buglioni, the first loss. Oh, my goodness. He looked he looked great ever since then. It was like the best thing to happen to him. Um, obviously, a lot of circumstances about that one. But, yeah, I, I, I really think he gets the job done here. He has to get the job done here. It's a massive fight. There's a lot on the line. Um, also on the card, Fabio Wardley, 14-0. I think he's probably got the longest undefeat... Not, not longest undefeated streak. Longest knockout streak, I think, right now in boxing, if I'm not mistaken. He fights here for the vacant British heavyweight title over 12 rounds. I don't think... Think it goes a distance. He gets in with Nathan Gorman, cousin of Tyson Fury, 19 and 1. The one loss came to Daniel Dubois. It's going to be a brilliant fight. That's that is, I think, probably fight of the card. That's a great, great, great fight. I cannot wait to see it. Um, Fabio Wardley, at times, I think it's not a popular opinion, but I think he's looked a bit vulnerable at times, and I think he can be outboxed. And Nathan Gorman is a good boxer who kind of gets underrated just because Daniel Dubois banged him out. Who doesn't Daniel Dubois bang out apart from Joe Joyce? I don't know. I think it's a good fight. The The, the odds on that fight should be close, because if Fabio Wardley got in with Daniel Dubois, how do we all think that one would have go, by the way? So, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Um... The main event, though, D uh, Dillian White, 28-3, and three, gets in with America's Jermaine Franklin, 21-0. and 0, It's over 12 rounds. Eddie, I don't know if you've heard anything about Jermaine Franklin. That's pretty much going to be my question to you. But from what we're hearing over here, he's come over here. I think he's been doing some work with Tyson Fury. I know he's been doing some work with Daniel Dubois. And by all accounts, he seems like he's quite fit. Um, got a good engine and apparently quite tough with a good chin. So a lot of people who seem to be in the know about this guy are saying it's not a walkover fight for Dillian White, this one. Oh, man, I, I don't know much about him. Um, but, you know, you know he's, he's coming over to working with those kind of guys uh, in the gym. You know, Tyson's a hell of a, hell of a gym partner to be to be in with. I mean, uh, wait, did I say that right? Tyson, right? Ty, he was. He said he was in with Tyson, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, and I know, like I said, I know what kind of what kind of partner he is, smart partner he is to have. You know what I mean? And that's not an easy one. But to be getting good reviews from him and different guys he's been working with, it's not. I mean, now granted, fighting is not smart, and experienced and experienced the top level also plays a part in that. Uh, but if you're able to compete with those guys in any form. Then you're not a you're not a you're not a slouch, believe me. So he's undefeated. He's coming in with a with a great deal of confidence, with 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 knowing that he's he's been in with good competition, preparing for it. Um, I'm 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 pretty sure he's not going to be a walkover. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Anything in boxing can happen. Obviously, he can go in there and go get knocked right out. It can happen. That that still doesn't mean he's nothing. But. Uh, it's not necessarily likely. He, you know, he's a, he's he's a tougher guy coming with a with a great deal of respect from respect from his peers. 
obviously pretty good guy, pretty good fighter. You know what I mean? So, you know, Dillian ain't got his work cut out. You know what I mean? He's going into this fight. Uh, he's, I mean, well, and that's a good thing for him. You know what I mean? You need to be pushed. You need to, you need to know that when I, you know, just because I've done what I've done in boxing, I've been close to winning a title. I fought one of the best fighters in the world and blah, blah, blah. You, 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 sometimes you need that extra, you know what I mean? To be, to, to make sure you're pushed and you're saying, I got to give my best, you know, cause the guy that's coming in is obviously challenging me with, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with, with, with something a little better than average, you know what I mean? Or something a lot better than average. So I've got to definitely come in and be willing to, uh, give a championship level performance. You should be up. Honestly, every time you come out, you should be ready. You should be prepared to do that because you got to make sure you let the let people know that there's levels to it. All right. And, 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 you know, you can't, you can't go in slouching. You know what I mean? If you're going to get back to the title, if you're going to be back, if you're going to be one of the best fighters in the world, you can't come in looking average, you know what I mean? For the most part. I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody has their, their lulls, but you got to be prepared to come in and fight at the highest level you can, uh, at, you know, it's at every single fight because every fight is a must win. You know what I mean? So if he wants to get back to that title, he's got to be prepared for this. And I don't think, I don't think this guy is going to be, uh, too much of a letdown for him, so he's got to be prepared to, to, to bring that, to bring that high level of uh, uh, f- uh, boxing ability in there, and he needs to win. He needs to win, and he needs to look good as well. Yeah, you're certainly right. If he wants uh, another big run at a title or whatever, he does need to impress. Um, we're going to move now to this one. It takes place at the Dignity Health Sports Park in Carson, California, USA. It's going to be on Fight TV, I believe, in the UK as well as the US, if I'm not mistaken. But on the undercard, we've got Charles Comwell, 17 and 0, getting in with Juan Carlos Abreu, who is 25 and 6 with a draw. I've seen Abreu uh, pull off a few upsets. Um, huge underdog. Um, I think been in with Jerron Ennis, been in with uh, a couple of other guys. Uh, elsewhere on the card, we've got a fight here for the light flyweight world titles, the IBF and WBO. We're going to see Yocasta Val, who is 26-2, get in with Evelyn Bermudez, who's 17-0 and with a draw. That's over 10 two-minute rounds there. It's actually two women, my apologies. Um, so, yeah, that's for the IBF and WBO light flyweight world titles. But the main event, it's a juicy one, Eddie. It's a juicy one. If you didn't know what was coming, then listen to this. Hope Jose Zapida, 26-2, fighting for the vacant WBC World Super Lightweight title against Regis Progray, 27-1, friend of the show, over 12 rounds. We had Regis on, I think it was last week. He feels he's too much for Zapida, and I reminded Regis that you know, Zapata's a really good fighter. Not that I reminded him of that, but you know, there's there's obviously levels in boxing, and you know. He showed last time out that Josue Vargas was nowhere near his level. And I'm not saying Vargas is a pretender by any means. But, you know, he got in there with obviously a guy in Zapida who was a much better fighter than him. And Zapida pretty much humiliated him in one round. And that just goes to show how many levels he is above this kind of level. Uh, or that kind of level. And obviously here we're seeing him in with one of the best in, in the division in my eyes in, in Regis Progre. Regis does feel like he's just too good, and I I don't want him to take that for granted. Obviously, we know that Zapita can dig deep. You know, <laughs> it, it reminds me of the fight he had with Baranchik, which was just the best fight I've seen in years. Um, but yeah, the fight before the the Vargas fight, obviously, fought Hank Lundy didn't look fantastic. You never kind of know what you're going to get with Zapata. He's a bit inconsistent. Regis Progre, though, been chomping at the bit to get a world title shot after losing narrowly to Josh Taylor in London. Here's his chance to become champion again, and he cannot wait. Um, it's a great fight, Eddie. Obviously, I'm back in Progre to win. I hope he wins. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a brilliant fight, truly, between two of the best at 140. No, it's a fantastic fight. It's not. It's a great opportunity for both guys. Obviously, um, uh, seeing that uh, Progress is extremely, extremely dangerous fighter, talented, good puncher, and uh, with Zapata, he's obviously shown that he's levels above Osve Vargas. That doesn't. There's no attack on him, but he's definitely at this level, and it's not going to be just an easy fight for him to walk through. However. Progray is like I said, he's extremely dangerous, extremely talented, explosive power. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a rough night. It's gonna be a rough night, possibly for for Zepeda. But I mean, I don't know. I mean, he, he may come in there and 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 shut me up as well in this particular thing. I don't, I haven't really seen so much of the guy. 
but he's done. I have seen a few fights he's been in. I see, like I said, I've seen the, the Vargas fight, and he's done well in that. Um, it's Like I said, it's not going to be easy for Pro Gray, but, but I'm still backing him. I think he should be able to win that fight, but it's uh it's gonna be a hell of a it's gonna be a hell of a fight up until the end i'll say that yeah i think it will be it'll be a great fight um i don't think that pro gray can just run him over but you know it'll be exciting if he does try to do that obviously zapeda you know very experienced as well it's going to be a great fight honestly i just love the fact that we're seeing a vacant title contested for between two of the best you know there's no one doubting that these two are probably top 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 three or four at five at, at, at best I mean when I think of the top guys at 140 off the top of my head it's Josh Taylor obviously it's um, Ramirez um, Zapida and Progre obviously you've got to give an honourable mention to Jack Catterall in there I don't think I'm missing anyone at the minute there um, Tiafimo Lopez still kind of got to get his fights in before we get carried away um, elsewhere on the undercard I almost forgot Ruben Torres 19 and 0 getting in with with Eduardo Estela who's 13 and 1 that's over 10, uh, 10 rounds there uh, we also have two sons of, of um, Fernando Vargas we've got Fernando Vargas Jr 6 and 0 in a 6 rounder against Alejandro Martinez who's 3 and 2 with a draw we also have Amado Vargas, Amado Vargas, 4-0 in a four-rounder against Osmar Hernandez, who's 1-1. One and, one. and also, we should mention, um, Bakodir Jalilov, 11-0 in a 10-round contest against Curtis Harper, 14-8. Um, and eight. Very surprised that Harper's still getting a TV slot after that time when he walked out the ring. Obviously, we, we never forget. Um, and yeah, moving out to the final card to mention, it takes place on Sunday. It's a Sunday afternoon card in the UK. Um, it's going down at the Ali Pali. It's going to be live on Sky. Uh, let's run through these fights, shall we? On the undercard, friend of the show, Shannon Ryan, 3-0. No opponent just yet. Um... We also have a good fight, really. Adam Azim, 6-0, getting in with the pint-sized powerhouse, Mr. Ryland Charlton, 9-3 um, with a draw. Um, I'm expecting Azim pretty much to walk through Charlton, unfortunately. Uh, we're going to see friend of the show, Sam Gilly, 14-1, getting in here with the... Uh, with the I don't know where I was going with that, but for the English Super Welterweight title, I think it's his, so he's going to be defending that against Sean Robinson, who's 11-1 with a draw. Friend of the show, Larone Richards, 16-0 in a 10-rounder against Zach Chelly, who's 12-1 with a draw. I, I'm not sure how good of a fight that's going to be. Larone Richards, obviously the much, much classier boxer. Um, Zach Chelly always comes to fight and will give it a go, but I can see him being you know walked onto shots all night and Lerone Richards doesn't give a damn about making a fight exciting probably going to go 10 rounds here and win on points and the main event Mikel Lawal 16 and 0 getting in here for the vacant British cruiserweight title against David Jameson who is 9 and 1 that's over 12 rounds there like I say at cruiserweight but that's about it for the preview part of the show in part 1 we did the review part we spoke to our special guest Archie Sharp in part 2 we did the news and I've just wrapped up the preview part just there the final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro which I'll do in just a few seconds Okay, and this wraps up episode 371 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to our special guest this week, the undefeated number one ranked super featherweight in the world with a WBO, Mr. Archie Sharp. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in. That's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again next week.